Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, our guest is a former New Ager. She's going to educate us on some things that are New Ager that Christians get involved in, as well as why people have demons. We've seen across the internet, across YouTube, of people getting delivered from demonic spirits. But she is going to share with us why these people had the spirits to begin with. And you're going to hear so much more. Candace Summer, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Jennifer, so much for having me back on. It's really kind of you. Appreciate it. So Candace, you told me earlier that you would want to start off in prayer so people's hearts would be softened and ears would be open to what you're about to say. So I will give the platform to you right now to pray for our audience. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So Heavenly Father, we just ask that every person that hears or sees this broadcast or will hear it or see it, Father, Lord, please give them eyes to see ears to hear, and a heart that can receive. And I pray according to Psalm 1914, Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. So Candace, we had you on, I believe last year. And when we had you on, we spoke about how you were actually a former Scientologist, an ex-Scientologist, mm-hmm. and you were heavily into new age and right right now you're going to explain a little bit more about new age and the dangers uh that christians are involved with because now we have churches doing yoga and ministers doing yoga and they find no problem with it uh they say um what they say it makes me feel good or when i'm doing it i'm thinking about jesus so i want you to tell us the dangers of yoga what it is um, the, the meaning of it. I know you know a lot of the stuff because you were deeply rooted in it. So I'll give the platform to you again. What is yoga? Why is it dangerous? And what is the root of it? Okay. Um, well, yoga means literally to be yoked to something. So to be yoked, if you think of two, you know, oxen in the things around their neck, you know, and they're yoked together. I mean, you're very closely intimately attached. So you always would want to know what are you being yoked to? And I think I mentioned this in our first interview that um, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. So if you're yoked to Jesus, uh, first and foremost, you should not be yoked to anything else. Um, Yoga is a spiritual practice in its, at, at its foundation, at its core. Um, in the Western world, many people see it as exercise or just a practice of mindfulness, and they don't see any harm in it. I practiced yoga, and I didn't find it dangerous to my physical body. You know, um, I found it very pleasing. But we're talking in a spiritual sense, and who I'm really talking to are are people who say that they are um, born again believers, walking with Christ. I say, don't be a liar. If, if you're really walking with Christ, there's no place for yoga in your life, okay? Because you're, you're, it, you're committing spiritual ador- adultery against the Father. And, you know, fornication, idolatry, adultery, it's all sin. Um, so you're just, you're in a sinful place. You have to, I would, I would, I would urge any believer who's struggling with their connection to, to yoga and, and, and telling themselves that it's okay. And if they, they just think about Jesus doing it go with the Holy Spirit and really ask, Lord, reveal to me, you know, what I'm doing, reveal to me how it makes you feel and and what I should or shouldn't be doing. I mean, you have to have a Holy Spirit revelation on it because I could bang you on the head all day and tell you it's bad, don't do it. But until you get the revelation, but it shouldn't be that difficult because it's clear to see just from God's word. It's not like I just woke up one day and I'm like, I think yoga is bad. You know, I mean, it's just clear. I knew as soon as I came to the Lord and um, understood some very basic things from his word that I could not do yoga and effectively, truthfully walk with him. So Candace, what part of the world does yoga come from? It comes from India. Um, It's a Hindu religious practice, uh, really. And of course, there's I've heard that there's millions of Hindu gods. Um, not just thousands, millions. So when you're practicing yoga, and again, you go to your yoga studio and it's all about your cute Lululemon outfit and whatever, you know, it still has a spiritual connection and root um, to the the foundations, which is a spiritual, religious um, practice of Hinduism and inviting those gods in. 
So, I mean, and, and if you're sensitive enough, you should be able to walk into a yoga studio and just feel the atmosphere. It's not a Christ filled atmosphere. As a believer, you should be very sensitive to the atmospheres that you're walking in and you should be changing the atmosphere, you know, if anything, with the Holy Spirit presence inside of you. Um, but that doesn't mean, well, that because I have the Holy Spirit and I'm so strong that I'm going to deliberately walk into, you know, antichrist atmospheres. I don't think that's necessarily smart either, um, unless you have a very clear directive from the Holy Spirit to do so for a specific purpose. Um, but just speaking further about New Age, um, I dislike the term New Age because there's nothing new about New Age. And as it says in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. And a lot of people get um, uh, concerned right away. A lot of Christians that, oh, that's New Age or that's New Age. A lot of what I see New Age has appropriated for themselves and defiled basically, but it's just a different spirit operating. For example, um, we're gonna talk about this later, the inner healing and deliverance that I'm learning. I've been recalling that when I was in Scientology, they were doing something to achieve a similar result, which was called auditing. So you would you would work with a counselor or with another person and they would have you go over a memory, you know, a, a negative memory, and they would say that has a charge on it, like literally an electrical charge. And you would just go over and over, keep recalling more and more details. And the idea was that you would recall the memory so much the point and so many times that it would release the negative charge or the thing on it like a life force or something and then then you would be more clear so when, in scientology when they say they want to clear the planet it wasn't that they wanted to kill everybody it's that they wanted all the people walking around with their trauma to be cleared of that trauma so they could be like operating at their full capacity now in theory that's actually a really positive idea that was one of the reasons i was attracted to Scientology. It's, you know, people, again, they hear a little bit and they think, oh, how could you be so stupid to be attracted to this or that? Because I'm a person that always looks deeper. So I was looking at what, what they were trying to say. But here is the, the trap, is that without Christ, it will never lead you to the Father. It will never lead to glory. It will never lead to goodness. L. Ron Hubbard died a miserable, sick, demented man. He had a lot of revelation how he got it um, I'm sure was demonic. And so there was a lot of truth in there, but mixed with lies and confusion. In the Bible, when it says, and thank you, Holy Spirit, because I don't even know where we're going here, but it's like I wrote down this um, uh, scripture to kind of lay out. In the Bible, when it says in John 10, 7, 10, um, then Jesus said unto them again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, Jesus. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. In and out implies liberty in your life, um, a freedom in your activity. And to find pasture means that he will not want for anything for the true life. Um, so he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, abundantly over and above, more than necessary, superior, um, uh, uncommon, more excellent, surpassing. That is the life that Jesus came to give us. And you cannot get that any other way, but through Jesus. So you can have things that look like Oh, well, this works. They have some success. Hey, maybe maybe even get healed. But who cares about the healing of your body if your soul and your spirit is dead and you have no life eternal? So that that's what the Holy Spirit downloaded me because I was kind of asking, like, this is kind of weird, Lord. Like, I was learning this in Scientology, but I know Scientology is not the way. And then that's what he showed me. Um, and it's, it's just the truth. <laughs> Is, is the truth. He is the truth, Jesus Christ. And when you mentioned how new age is basically a copy of God, what do you mean? Well, I, I don't want to say everything across the board, but for example, um, I mean, just having the Holy Spirit, you know, um, there are people who uh, will, psychics, psychics can see in the spirit, um, true psychics. And they can receive revelation, but it's the spirit 
behind it. So, so if you have, I came from the new age, right? So I, I visited psychics and stuff. And when I first started um, encountering prophecy in the Bible, and then even prophets today, supposedly and stuff, I was very like, I even did a little video about, it, I remember on my channel, like, I don't know about prophets for today. And how is this different from being psychic or whatever? Well, again, as you come into more revelation of the Lord, you see how there, there's a godly experience, there's a godly way, there's a godly path. And then there's the thieves and the robbers who want to enter in a different way. D does that make sense? So it's like prophecy is true. Seeing in the spirit is true. And that is a gift that is given by God, but not everybody that's exercising it is exercising it through the power of God. Because God, God wants us to have it all. But you're a parent, I'm a parent. No loving parent would give the keys to a Ferrari to their child because they'll crash and burn it and destroy themselves. That is why God wants us to submit to him so that he can teach us, so he can guide us to eternity and not destroy ourselves. The devil comes and he doesn't care about us. And he said, and he, that's what he did in the garden. Adam and Eve, oh, God doesn't want you to have it. I'm going to give it to you. I mean, again, you see that you don't want the bad kid at school, you know, quote unquote, bad kid to be giving your kids drugs or whatever, leading them astray. You, you would come in and be like, no, you know, and your child might be like, you don't love me. You don't, you know, and it's like, but you know, I, I don't, I, I'm so glad I'm a parent because I, I can just understand the father so well from parents' eyes. I don't feel that he wants to restrict us or control us in any way. He wants us to have freedom. He gives us our freedom. Jesus is the only way we can have our freedom, but he wants us to be in order for our well-being. When we're talking about new age, what spirit did you say is linked to new age? The spirit of Python. So, um, and I don't have the scripture, but it's somewhere in the Bible, Paul is walking with Timothy or something and that, that uh, girl or whatever is walking behind them. Oh, these men of God, blah, blah, you know, like praising, declaring who they are, um, but annoying the heck out of Paul. And it went on for days or something. And finally, it was like Paul discerned the spirit and said, come out of her. So it's a good lesson. And it was the spirit of Python. And I, when I researched, I looked it up. Python is divination, the spirit of divination. Divining is like, you know, trying to do anything in occult means. Um, so that pretty much covers like all of new age is, as far as I understand. So again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's not necessarily the revelation that's coming from a, a false spirit, but it's, it's the spirit behind it. It's kind of hard to describe, um, but that's why you have to you have to know the word of God and you have to be able to, through the Holy Spirit, discern your atmosphere. And then even the discerning of spirits, which means you can see in the spirit what somebody's being controlled by. Then um, that's a gift that's given. So Candace, uh, you mentioned earlier on the topic of spirits, you mentioned earlier that there is an uptick, which we all know, if you've been on YouTube, you know, there's, there's an uptick of deliverance videos, a lot of deliverance videos of people being delivered from all type of spirits. Mm -hmm. But you said you want to go deeper and you want to explain why these people have these spirits. So how did they get these spirits to begin with? What do you say? Well, okay, I, I'm not going to have an exhaustive answer. I'm definitely not the authority on this. Um, but as I mentioned to you, I've been um, blessed enough to be in a school of ministry at my church where they're teaching on this stuff. So people have, you know, demons for all kinds of reasons. I mean, the ma major one obviously is sin. Um, but it's like, well, what if I don't have any obvious or I'm not walking in any obvious sin. So why am I demonized or why am I having this issue? It can be generational um, curses. It's, uh, th but the main thing, what I, what I came here to talk about is that all people have wounds and wounds give legal right to demonic access. So let, let me back up a little bit and just say the, the first, and I believe the greatest deliverance that any believer will ever receive is the day that they're born again. Um, because that is the day that you were translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay. So the way that I've been taught, and I understand this to be true, you know, we're, we're made in the image of God, right? God is three in one. He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we are spirit, soul, and body. When you are born again, it's your spirit, the very essence um, of you. 
comes from God. God is spirit. He infuses his spirit in you. You are born again. You are saved. But most people, me included, the day that I was born again, all of my issues or problems or whatever did not disappear in an instant. And this was actually something I, I wondered and pondered about um, er, in my early, earlier days of when I was saved is like, because I would view, I would observe that many Christians, it seemed like the whole point was just to be saved. And I thought, well, Lord, if the whole point is just to be saved, I'm saved, take me up, you know, like, what am I doing here now? So it became evident to me through asking that question that there's something more, you know, the goal is not just for, for me to get saved and then psh, I'm out of here. So that's been the process, some of the process of discovery I've been on. So your soul, I mean, sorry, your spirit is saved, your soul which is also three parts, mind, will, and emotions, is being saved, meaning in process, i.e. sanctification, okay? But we have a lot of wounds and traumas, um, which I'll get to, and then the body will be saved in resurrection. So anyway, so our, our, our savedness is in three parts. So now getting to the soul, because most people, our, our soul is the biggest thing in our life. It should be that when we're led by the spirit, it's because we, the soul comes down and the spirit is what is over our life. That's being led by the spirit. But you have to do things to feed and grow your spirit. Um, even though you're saved, that's why not all born again believers are on an, a, an equal, they're only equal at salvation. But why do you see some believers walking in glory and like just revelation and like amazing gifts or whatever, and then joe bob over here he's been a christian for 35 years you don't go to church but he doesn't understand anything he's still drinking milk you know to to quote paul um it's because he just sat around being grateful he was saved and didn't understand that you have to appropriate um what has been paid for in christ and and that's our one of our jobs i believe as believers so so the soul soul wounds Everybody has wounds. Uh, another word for it is traumas. Um, everybody experience tra experiences traumas in their life. The way our soul is designed is that when you have a trauma, literally a piece of that soul disassociates. You know, they understand this in clinical psychology circles very well, um, disassociation. And you don't have to um, have experienced what you think is a major trauma to have this. And most of our trauma we receive as children because we're too young to have the coping mechanisms and understand. Like I can remember, I was a very sensitive child. If somebody, especially like an adult that I didn't know very well, snapped at me or spoke to me in the wrong way, oh man, like it just like, I could almost cry. Like I would, you know, all those little things you think insignificant now as an adult, but as a child, it's a big deal. And those even create little wounds. And, and so they siphon off, they're also called alters, which is just a shortened term for alternate personality. So now you have a wound, you've given legal right um, for things to live inside that wound, a wound that you might not even be aware that you have because you've blocked it out of your memory or, or whatever. And this was God's design. I'm sorry, I'm looking for my notes. Um, this was God's design so that we could carry on with daily life, even amid, amidst major trauma. So it was a gift that now the enemy has, you know, misused. But what I was looking for my notes is, so there are things that live in soul wounds, lies, emotions, unforgiveness, curses, protectors, and demons. So not everything is necessarily a demon as we might see it, you know, um, or you might think of it like in a horror film kind of way, you know, um, but wherever there are wounds, it gives license to the spirit of things to live around it or in it. So we need to get those wounds healed. And who is the healer? Jesus. We have to bring truth to the lies. Who's the truth? Jesus. So what I've been learning is something called inner healing and the process of inner healing is simply and beautifully bringing encounter to the to the wounded person, uh, bringing encounter with Jesus so that that wound can be um, healed. And people might ask, well, I, where, where do you see this in the Bible? All right, so here, there's, there's a lot of scripture to back this up, but I just wanna read some from Isaiah 61 because it's powerful. This is Jesus speaking. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So 
bind up the brokenhearted literally means to heal a broken heart. What is a broken heart? It's a, it's a crushed soul. It's a fragmented soul. It's a soul that's scattered and fallen apart. And he's come to bind it, to bring it um, together, to put us together. He wants to make us whole. That's what Jesus does. Um, and just an interesting aside, um, captives, ca to be captive is usually when you're in bondage to your own um, lies, like believing lies or mindsets or strongholds. But a prisoner is somebody who's been sent to prison by God for unforgiveness because you know it says in the Bible that um, you know I cannot forgive you if you don't forgive so that's a that's a big one people are holding on to unforgiveness and it this is yeah it's you have to understand it's important that this is not an intellectual process because nine out of ten times you ask somebody like oh well what about this thing you know they tell they tell you a memory or something well, did you forgive them oh I forgave that person a long time ago well if you go back to the memory and they really enter into the memory and emotion comes up, it will quickly become very clear that there's still a lot of hurt, anger, um, unforgiveness. And so that's what we're looking to, to, to really just bring out in people. And then you just call, call Jesus because it says, whoever calls on me shall be delivered. Jesus shows up every time. And then he, he does the ministering, not me, not the person that I'm working with, um, you know, the Holy Spirit, we just, it, we're guided by the Holy Spirit. Like this is not a formula because the minute that you have a formula, um, the Holy Spirit's not present. Okay. So you can't, a lot of people will, you know, they'll see videos and stuff and they'll be like, oh, my sister or my brother or my mother, they need to get delivered. Well, you can't force deliverance on somebody. You know, they have to come to the revelation and, and confess, repent and renounce. Okay, the, those are like our key things that we look for, that we make sure we guide the process, the person through. And deliverance, God, God can, can and will deliver you from a spirit, but a lot of times there's a pattern also associated with um, what you're trying to be delivered from. And that's something that you, you have to make an effort a lot of times to change. And that comes in with strongholds. Um, I think I talked earlier with you, where I was saying the number one stronghold is seeing God incorrectly. So you can love God, you know, you worship, um, you know, every day and praise whatever. But if you dig deep enough, you find there's actually a part in your soul that doesn't trust God or, th or believes that God, um, here, I'll give a real life example. A couple of weeks ago, I was working with a woman um, we we're doing an inner healing and beautiful young woman clearly love God, passionate for God. And a memory came in. She lost her mother when she was in second grade. You know, her mother died to breast cancer. And she went into that memory and it came up that she believed that God took her mom from her, that, you know, that God made her sick and that God took her mom and she couldn't understand why. And so all that emotion came up and we were able to, not we, she was able to br bring it up and then we ask the person to see themselves giving it to Jesus because he says, you know, it's like, give me your burdens, you know, give it to Jesus. People love to say, give it to Jesus. And I remember I think, well, Lord, what does that mean? How do I give it to you? Well, you have to get in touch with what's there first and then come to the revelation that, oh my gosh, I've been holding on to this. Father, I confess that I've, I've been believing a lie. I've been believing that you didn't really love me or that you wanted me to suffer because I lost my mother at this young age. I repent, Lord, I repent and I, and I, I give it to you. And then we say, great, you see, you want the person to see them giving it to Jesus. And then you say, and what does he give you in return? Because he will always exchange truth for the lie. And they, they through the the Holy Spirit are the one that hears it. You don't ever tell people what they hear, or what they see, and it's beautiful and it's amazing what they experience. And it's, real healing as a result that's that's really good and but a little bit earlier mind you you were a borderline expert into new age and you mentioned that when trauma happens a part of the soul breaks off you know and it scatters you know we've heard that before but there are some christians who may think that that's new age now you were in new age is that new age no, that I don't believe it's new age. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to bring scripture 
to clarify and support what I'm saying. Isaiah 53, 4, 5, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. What does that mean? You know, um, Proverbs 25, 2 says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the glory of kings to search out a matter. We are to question and search and seek and ask. Inner healing is giving people a really tangible way to use what we've been told in scripture to have Jesus, like I said, what does it mean to give God our, our burdens? Literally, Holy Spirit, come. I'm, later, I want to lead, I, I want to give a little brief outline of how you can self inner heal it yourself, but I, I just implore people to try this, um, just try it with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's you and the Holy Spirit. It's not, if you think talking to the Holy Spirit and to Jesus is new age, then I, I can't help you. I, I, I don't know what to say. Joel 2.32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. So. Jesus is our deliverer. He is our healer. He speaks truth to lies, but he will never go against our will. And so we have to come to the point where we have the revelation. You can't really confess and repent for something when you don't have the revelation that you did anything wrong. So inner healing is just a process to help you come to a greater, to, to shine light on darkness. Lord, what, what is inside me that um, I'm not seeing that is not of you that is hindering me that you don't want there. So do you believe that the reason why so many people are having to get delivered from demons is because of the trauma and the hurt that they experienced? It's definitely a big part. I mean, I, I never want to say like, again, I'm not here saying this is the you know solution to every problem. Um, th this is a big piece to the puzzle though, that I believe. And, and the reason I, I felt Holy Spirit um, prompted me to want to share this with you now is because of the attention that the deliverance ministries across the country and around the world are getting. Deliverance is important and it's nothing new. Matthew 10, 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you receive, freely you give. Every ministry, in my opinion, should be doing this. It shouldn't be like, oh, oh, oh we're a deliverance ministry. That's just what the Bible says. That's what you should do. But I, I have a little bit of a concern. What I'm seeing is that it's being sensationalized a little bit, that there's this other component. You don't want to be yelling at somebody, you know, like, come out, come out. And what you're yelling at is a wound. If you see somebody crying, um, demons don't cry. This is what I've been, t been taught. You know, demons don't cry. If somebody's crying, that is a wound. A wound can present demonically. It can look demonic. But we have to, the other great thing about this understanding is that it cultivates compassion um, because you, you take things less personally and you realize people are acting out of their wounds. They're acting out of their woundedness and their hurt. And the more that you have eyes to see that and a heart of understanding for that, the better that you can actually minister and help those people. And even in just your daily life, not be so ready to be offended. Um, that's a big one. That's really hard. You know, offense. Just an aside, I heard somebody quote that 84% of people who leave churches leave because of, a, of an offense. And I'm sure you've heard of that book, The Bait of Satan. I forget the author, but it's very popular. John Bevere. Yeah. 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 Um, offense. Because everybody's reacting to out of their wounds and to other people's woundedness. So it's a big component. Um, Sozo, the word sozo is a Greek word that's actually the word that Paul used for saved in the Bible. And it doesn't mean just saved, it means saved, healed, delivered, made whole. And, and just going back to the very beginning, what I was trying to say is that when we are born again, hallelujah, glory to God, thank you, Jesus, but we're not instantly made whole. It's evident. I know I'm certainly not. Uh, you have Apostle Paul. I mean, he's the more he walked with the Lord, the more broken he really saw that he was. The more humble he he became, uh, just for the revelation of like, my gosh, you know, this life. I don't know. Um, so 
that's what the this is our walk this is our sanctification this is the process it's not just i'm saved and now i just sit around waiting for if you believe the rapture or just the day i die so i can go to heaven there's work to be done not work for your salvation that was a free gift paid for by jesus you receive it hallelujah but there are rewards and crowns in heaven um, not everybody's going to be equal I want to, again, as Apostle Paul said, I want to run my race like to the fullest because this life, I was just reading Psalm uh, 90 or something. It says, you know, like, you know, we live maybe 70 to 80 years old and then we fly away. This life is a vapor. It is such a gift. This life is such a gift. And, you know, when it says in the Bible that God is no respecter of persons, you know, Jesus died for everyone, everyone. This is available to everyone but few will find it because they care more about what's in front of them. You know, they, they care more about their, their job, career, their family, their position in life, their friends, sports, whatever it is. And that's why God says, you, you can't have idols. You can't put anything before me. If you really want this, like if you really want it. Ever wanted the experience of attending a genuine Royal ball? Well, here's your chance. Join Deep Believer Ministries for one of the grandest, most powerful events ever to solely honor King Jesus with a night with the King at the Broadmoor. Enjoy the magnificent grounds, accommodations, and fine dining of the five-star, five-diamond, exquisite Broadmoor Resort in Colorado Springs, Colorado. A night with the King at the Broadmoor is a very royal, very formal three days, two nights conference that will provide you with hands-on training for true Christian supernatural living by renowned teachers and evangelists. This includes training in multiple areas of healing, deliverance, spiritual warfare, how to walk out the abundant Christian life, as well as how to obtain success in finances God's way. Then for the Royal Evening, Soak in the ambiance of white tablecloth gourmet dining, live brass and stringed instruments, acclaimed Christian singers and worshipers. And what's a royal ball without ballroom dancing? Don't know how? Complimentary ballroom dance lessons are included. A night with the King at the Broadmoor will be a night of complete honor and reverence to our King Jesus and will be like nothing you've possibly ever experienced. We hope to see you there for this stately, eventful night. So, Candace, you said something that I think is really important. You said that most or all ministries should be doing deliverance. It shouldn't be a small pocket of people doing deliverance. It's a part of the gospel. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Because it's true. Every ministry who is truly in Christ should be doing deliverance. Could you elaborate just a little bit more on that? You should just be prepared to be led by the Holy Spirit. And again, be able to discern. For example, at my church, every, every week there's an altar call and then there's prayer ministry offered at the end. Um, it's not when I was at another church, it was like once in a blue moon that happened. It's just every week. And so people will come up for the altar call, you know, and give them their lives to Jesus. Um, and then right then and there, we baptize people and um, pray for baptism in the Holy Spirit and everything, because that's the way it was done in the Bible. So deliverance is no different. It's like people come up for prayer and it's not, again, um, you know, everybody has their different style. And I think I, I mentioned to you, uh, Mike Signorelli came to our church, which um, I, he's one of these big guys in the deliverance movement right now. And I didn't even know who he was until he came to our church. And bless him, he's a great, great guy, but he's really, you know, the mass deliverance thing. And um, my apostle was saying, they we just bought a second church in Tacoma, which is really exciting. And so Mike Signorelli went there and they had, you know, all these people there that they didn't know. And so there was no altar call or anything. And it was like, people were coming up for mass deliverance. And my apostle was saying that, she forgot in a moment she was ministering to somebody this person didn't even know jesus but they were like i want to be healed and i want that you know so she had to lead them to jesus and then you know but she's like we forget because we do that every week at our church um and so it's just, as i said same with deliverance um as a prayer minister i mean people will come up to me sometimes it's just as simple as um you know they're they just need to confess something 
repent and renounce it and you just like pray a blessing over them um but for me it's really more about i trying to identify the wound or the unforgiveness and then the deliverance comes at the end you know um you know we we demand every unclean spirit out of you you know and you name them you know but it's a process of discovery a lot of times so it's like that's again why you need the inner healing because you you don't you don't know but when you know when you've been able to identify them anger come out of her sickness infirmity come out of her you know but you've hopefully dismantled some of their legal right and it's a process deliverance is a process um and it, as it's not it's a means to an end it's not the end all be all and then that's why it should just be normal because it's not like woohoo we did we did deliverance you know i personally have never had the manifestation of like puking all over or whatever. I feel like that's another, a little bit of like a preconceived notion. And I'll admit that I've even felt it too. Like, well, have I really been delivered of a demon? I mean, like I never like puked or had this huge manifestation, um, but I've had different manifestations. You can also receive deliverance in your bedroom, reading the word of God. And again, I'm trying, what I'm hoping to show is that the deliverance really is between you and the Lord. Ultimately, we have ministers and people in our lives to help and assist. And of course we lean on one another, you know, brothers and sisters in the Christ, in Christ, but it, it should be something that you're constantly talking with and, and doing with the Holy Spirit, not deliverance per se, but should always be in communication with the Holy Spirit. What if people are like, okay, we're talking about soul wounds and deliverance, but what if the soul wounds and the trauma that I experienced is not my fault? Well, yeah, I, most of the time um, it's not, at least it's perceived. So one of the things we do in that process after uh, what we call, you know, presenting Jesus is the person has an opportunity to name and give all of those negative emotions to Jesus. But then if there are other people in the memory, like a perpetrator, then they have the opportunity to speak to that person and tell them what that person did to them what it cost them. And we, we hopefully are able to guide them to a point where they can truly forgive that person. Because yeah, that is a really good question. Because again, uh, as I said earlier, unforgiveness is a huge, unforgiveness is sin. But a lot of people are offended by the church because it's like, oh, well, you can't forgive them, you're in sin. Well, because just saying I forgive them isn't true forgiveness. So again, this is a process of discovery utilizing deep understanding of scripture of how Jesus does it um, and how how he delivers us from it because yeah you you'll walk around with something stuffed down for 20 years because you keep saying I forgive I forgive I forgive but you know darn well inside that you you aren't in forgiveness towards them so Candace you mentioned that you want to touch on soul ties because you feel like that's a big issue as well right now well, yeah, it's another term that I agree might sound new agey. And when I first heard it, it's like, what, Where, where's that in the Bible? And it's something um, that is addressed in the process of inner healing and deliverance a lot of times. And so I'm just going to read some scripture um, used to support and understanding a little bit what a soul tie is. Genesis 34, one through three, and Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. So then I looked up clave, and it means to stick with, to cling, to be joined together. So oftentimes, um, I mean, something we do the first time we're doing an inner healing with somebody, they have to watch a couple couple videos beforehand and their homework is to go through and break soul ties with any person that they've ever slept with that is not their spouse or partner because um, in Genesis 2 24 therefore shall a man shall uh, leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh so again here we have that word cleave so now you could read it on the surface level and not think this, you know what I mean? You could read on the surface level and go, well, that just means, you know, you, you, when you get married, you know, you guys become like one, you know, cause you gotta be married. That's one level of understanding. But again, when you are searching and asking Holy Spirit and digging deeper, you get deeper revelation. And so you understand there's an exchange, there's a transaction that happens between 
people when you're close to them. And not all soul ties are negative. We have soul ties with our spouses, with our children, with our parents. You can choose to break a soul tie or you can simply cleanse a soul tie. Um, um, when, you can have soul ties with your good friends. And David went out to meet them. This is First Chronicles 12, 17, and answered and said unto them, if you come peaceably unto me, help me, mine heart shall be knit unto you. Um, heart, you know, that is our soul. You know, we, we are knit together um, with those that we're in close relationship with. So simple way that we cleanse a soul tie. Um, uh, Father God, you know, I repent for this ungodly uh, relationship or, you know, whatever. And I just release so-and-so to you. Um, I, I give back to them everything that I took from them or they gave to me that is not of you. And I call back everything from them that they took from me back to me and you know i break it by the blood of jesus something very simple that's breaking a soul tie so it's an it's our words and our declarations are meaningful and important um because action follows words and that's what, anyway so that, that's breaking soul ties i don't think think that's new age and i hope that i did a decent job clarifying that um what people mean when they're talking about that so let's go on to church now we're not denying that a lot of churches are not right especially in the western world but there are a lot of people who are not going to church or a community or even a house church whatever um but the lord says don't forsake the assemblings of ourselves one to another and a lot of people are just doing online church but what do you see the issue is there and i know you have an example yeah, I felt called to speak to this aspect because, well, one, here I am on your platform, which is a growing platform. Um, and I know a lot of people are attracted to to just content all over the internet. It's constantly drawing our attention. I have a channel and I'm sure that there are people um, that just, you know, watch me and a million other people um, in place of sound doctrine, you know, belonging to a community. And so I felt to speak to this that I, I want to just really, um, express that the, the whole purpose the, the our main the prize is god it's jesus and the father it's it's um it's it's his presence it's not so that i can get healed so that i can live my best life so that i can feel better we're going to have trials and tribulations we're going to be tested um but it's that ability to to hold fast to the lord and really let him walk with you through everything and and i believe um the, the holy spirit prompted me that you need to be part of a community church is a dirty word to a lot of people because they've had church hurt or they think the institution but the true church is the body of christ so yes as you said jennifer if if not a, an actual church building ask holy spirit and have him lead you and guide you to Create a house church, have a house church, um, get into fellowship and community somehow, some way, because God builds relationally. He works relationally. Yes, it's you and the Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Lord, and you're, that is your first and direct connection. But you can't, you're going to have difficulty walking any of this stuff out or really growing in the Lord, I believe, if you don't have a community, if you don't have um, people that you trust and are guiding and leading and, and all of that. So um i just i just wanted that to really hit home that these, these are tools and things but get in a community ask holy spirit where would you have me um as i share with you off camera there are some people in our church uh, that we were just introduced to last night two separate people women who saw our church online and felt led to come from across the country to attend our church because they said i've been praying for a ministry like this it's not where i am so i'm going to it and if you're really committed, then then you will answer a call like that, if that indeed is your call. So I, I want people to understand that you are such a, a, a target for the enemy when you're in isolation, um, that because you have no accountability, um, you know, the battle is in the mind, you know, the devil can just be attacking with so many thoughts of offense and this and that. Oh, and this, this is another really important key. Um, but I'm reading a book now called Healing the Orphan Spirit. The orphan spirit is not a spirit that you can be delivered from. It has to be healed. And so many of us have this orphan spirit. You don't have to be a literal orphan, but it's that orphan that feels like they don't belong, like um, they can only receive love 
if it's performance based by what they do and it's not about who you are and and if you have that orphan spirit you can't really have that connection with the father and so the first thing is you've got to get that orphan spirit healed and it's all about knowing your true identity in christ and that father is a good good father that he is faithful and i wouldn't know any of this stuff if i was not in the church and the school of ministry that i'm in today i've, I've been saved for uh it'll be five years in february there are people I know that are in the school of ministry, you know, they're much older than me and they're like, I sat in a church for 30 years, you know, and I just wish, you know, and so I just thank, praise God. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to sit down and gleaned all of this in the short time. And with my limited understanding, you've got to expose yourself and say, God, show me, lead me, guide me. And God works through people. It's not just revelation. God works revelationally, but it's also relationally. And here's the other thing. He works generationally. You can't leave a legacy for your children if, if you're just a one man show. It's a really hard because you haven't built anything to pass on. So, so Candace, what made you come to this conclusion or what put this on your heart to make you feel like, okay, this is something I really need to touch on. What was the inception of it? Well, you know, the way Holy Spirit works, um, there's a gentleman named Torben Sondegaard. He's a, a Danish guy. Um, if, you, if you're on the inter internet, you may have seen him. He's a tall, uh, was bald headed Danish guy. And I came across him a couple years ago. He's got a YouTube channel called The Last Reformation. And this was, again, in my earlier days of being saved, where I'm searching and looking and seeing, like, you know, what is this Christianity all about? And is, you know, what I'm learning in church, I mean, what else is there? And I was attracted to him because he's kind of radical. And he was uh, really exiled from Denmark for praying for people on the street. Like, there, it's a very religious, um, restrictive culture, I guess, in Denmark, you know, where people are just like kind of born into the church, you know, and baby baptism. And it's a, anyway, so he was exiled and he's radical and he, he's awesome. And he, um, I learned that he was speaking somewhere in Washington. This was a few years ago now. And so I went to see him because I, I felt led to, and it, and it was a blessing. He's an excellent teacher and very um, funny and everything. And I was so excited by what he had to share. And I, I went up to him afterwards, you know, and greeted him, thanked him. And I said, would you be willing like to come to my church, um, like to talk about this stuff? And I remember he, he was like, oh no, you know, I don't really like to go to churches because his experience had been that they're so asleep. And he just, he kind of got like, you know, uh, this kind of, anyway, that was his response to me. Fast forward to, he just spent over a year in jail in prison, um, wrongfully accused and was just, praise God, released. And I happened to watch, he put out a series of messages and I just happened to click on this one and it was like five minutes long. And in it, he was sharing that, uh, you know, sitting in the jail cell, of course, he was having a lot of anger and frustration and resentment and thinking about the church and where are they and why aren't they helping and coming to my aid and whatever. And he had a, a revelation and I'm kind of putting words in his mouth. I don't know exactly, but the point was he had a revelation um, and he and his wife had to repent because they had really shunned the church. They hadn't poured into that community, into the body of Christ. They kind of went off and were doing their own thing. And I just thought, wow, that's so powerful because then I remembered that conversation where, yeah, I was like trying, would you come and like share this with my church? They need it. And was like, no, no. And I'm not saying that he should have or shouldn't have, but it's, again, it's that orphan spirit. Like, you know, I've been rejected and dejected and, and I, there's some part of him was in unforgiveness. Some part of him was holding anger, resentment. And that's the thing, it's never over. You know, it's always going to be onion layer after onion layer, you know, where the point is not to finish. Christ finished it. It is finished in Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But I want to get as much as I can in the Lord. I want I want me to be so dead that God is magnified and that people see you know, Jesus in me. And th this is so funny. I was thinking this about the new age too. In new age, the whole thing is you are God. You are God. You are God. That's the thing. You are God. But here's, here's a good example of how it gets tweaked. I'm not God. You're not God. 
but God lives in us. And it is our great privilege and honor to let him lead and live through us. We are his hands and his feet, but we have to get out of the way. So that's just the way, you know, new age again is twisted it. So Candace, why do you think that new agers copy or new age copies so much of the Bible where if you were to look at new age, you see that a lot of the things that they do, you see it's in the Bible, but yet they twist it to make it seem as if they're the ones who do it. Well, can you give a specific example? Like you said earlier, how I am my own God, like Oprah, Oprah Winfrey. Um, Mm -hmm. She was huge on the book, The Secret. I don't know if she still is, but she believed that where she got to right now is because of there was a God. I can't even say there was a God in her, but um, that she believed that she was a little God and that she was able to do all these things. Like I know how New Agers um, believe that um, if you were to do this thing, this would happen. And a lot of like they, a lot of the things that they do, I've realized is in Proverbs. Like King Solomon said a lot of these things, but they twist it to make themselves seem as if it came from them, but not from God. And that you're the reason Thank why you. it happens and not Thank you. God. Yes. That's an excellent question. And it came back to me where, what you triggered in my mind um, to go to. Great question. First of all, most people that are really in the new age, they don't know the Bible. I I think it's really true that um, until you have the Holy Spirit, you can't properly decipher the Bible. I recall watching like new agers talk about, um, you know, again, a part, maybe it's in Proverbs where it talks about thine eye be single. And they're like, that's the third eye. It's talking about the third eye. And it's just like, you know, you will find whatever you want and twist it. And, you know, I mean, and I read it now and stuff and I'm just like, oh. Sorry, but but here, so here's the main reason I think the new agers, because like I said, Satan is a mimicker, not a creator. And what did Satan want? Satan wanted the power and the glory of God. And what the main attraction of the new age and cult practices is power. I listened to something uh, the other day, it was somebody else talking about this and it was a quip of a man named John Wimber. And I believe he was like a pastor who created the vineyard or, or whatever in California. And I don't know what his past was, but obviously he came out of the new age or something. And he said, when I worked for the devil, he let me do all the stuff. Meaning, you know, like I said, the devil doesn't care if you crash and burn, he'll give you the Ferrari and the keys way anytime, just ask for it, he'll give it to you. People want the Ferrari, they want the power. But when he went to the church, he said, you know, I'm reading Acts and all this stuff. And I get to the church and he's like, I'm not raising my hand. Like, when do we get to do all the stuff? And they're like, oh, we, we don't do the stuff. We just have to believe that the stuff happened at one time. You get what I'm saying? It's like cessationism. No, the gifts aren't for today. No, you're not. No, I, we know Jesus did that, but you're not supposed to do that. That's the problem why people are going to new age instead of the church, because they don't see the power in the church. That is good. And that's and so the power true. in new age is yeah. deception. You're going to crash and burn. You might get healing. You might get fame. You might get money. You might get success, but it's always going to be empty because it's godless. You're right. The church has been asleep and dead for so long. People, you know, I feel like, and I truly believe this, we are made to be worshipers. That's what God created us to be mm-hmm. as worshipers and Christ father, at least we are the only one we're supposed to be worshiping. And like you said, the church is so dead where they're like, okay, well, let's see. We need to see something. We need to feel something. We need to know that, you know, there's some supernatural somewhere, you know, there's, there's something higher than me. As a matter of fact, there was a guy, uh, he was a street preacher, I think, and he was doing street preaching. And then there was a man who came up to him and he was actually a warlock. And he began conversing with the warlock. The warlock expected him to be afraid, but he wasn't afraid because he knew Holy Spirit was with them. So then as he began to chat with the warlock, he asked him, how did you get this way? And he said, when I was a teenager, I had a supernatural experience and I saw God or I saw Jesus. So then his parents were believers. They went to church and he talked to his pastor about it. And his pastor, like what you just mentioned, was a sensationalist. And he said, basically, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, It was a dream. You're probably just hallucinating. It's not real. So then he said, you know what? If this whole thing, if Christianity isn't real, 
I want to go to where I know something is real. So he went to the satanic realm because he knew that he would see some kind of action beyond his own power. So mm-hmm. it's, I'm glad you mentioned that because the church needs to wake up. I mean, a lot of people are tired, which is why, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, that pastor, excuse me, why that pastor had no dealings with the church because like you said, church hurt, but this is something we need to forgive and overcome and pray for the church and help build them back. I know when I, when I had my, as I shared in our first interview, um, my Jesus encounter that when I was like born again, that was the revelation. It was like, I want to tell everybody, Jesus is the most supernatural thing you could ever imagine. And mm. that's when you go into the Bible with eyes like that, that's why people have to turn their brain off and be like, oh, well, it's allegory, it's metaphor. It's not, they have to come up with all these things because it's so out there. So you mentioned something earlier. I mean, and this will, I think would help is that you said that there are so many people who don't know their identity in Christ. And they're like, okay, what does that even mean for some people? Because they may feel worthless because they don't know who they are. A lot of people really don't know who they are in Christ. So they just think they're here surviving life or just going through. Um, But I truly believe if you know who you are in Christ, you and I feel like the devil hinders you from knowing that. So how would you explain or say guide someone on to knowing their identity in Jesus Christ? Well, that's a, also a great question. I, I, <laughs> I wish I had in front of me. Um, I would say go to the word. I, I had a one day I was at church and this was my old church and they they handed out a worksheet um, that had all these scripture of who, that tells you who you are in Christ. And so I went and kind of did my own little Bible study and I put tabs and all my Bible, whatever. And just going through the process of that was revelational and healing. Um, But, you know, we are, we are sons and daughters, you know, we, we are sons, we, we, and daughters, we belong. Um, The father loves us just because of who we are. Um, I wish it's taped to my desk where I go get it because I have a thing that I try to say every day about who I am in Christ. I mean, but I would just say, go to the word, go, go on the internet, Google scripture about who I am in Christ and read it. And then, you know, highlight in your Bible or whatever, make it a little, um, you know, Bible study for yourself or word study um, and, and then really meditate on what it's saying. Holy Spirit, who am I to God? You know, what, what does father think of me? Amen. And I know Ephesians is a great book. If anybody wants to know who they are in Christ, if they just read the book of Ephesians, it literally tells them who they are. And if you recite those, I mean, it's like, bam, in your face. Yes. And that's a powerful practice, by the way, speaking God's word out loud. It's like washing yourself in the word. And that's a way to renew your mind. Um, But particularly out loud. I've been Amen. something I've been doing because yeah, you know, we const- we have to be renewing our mind. It's just, you can't, if you, you can't be bored in uh, the kingdom of God. If you're bored, you're missing it. I you're agree. missing it because there's agree. so, there's so much and it will never end. You know, we'll, I'll die long before I ever get to the end of it, but I want to go for it. You know, you mentioned inner healing, how those watching right now, you can help them to understand how to do inner healing or inner deliverance on themselves if they don't have access to anyone else. Yeah, I just wanted to leave your audience with a little tidbit um, of something they could take away. So this isn't just me talking, talking, talking. um, and, And again, people walking away feeling like, well, I don't know what the tool is, or I don't understand. So, and, and please understand there, there's a lot more dimensions to inner healing, but this is just the bare bones. Um, and Holy Spirit is your guide, you know, Holy Spirit will lead you. So the first thing is, um, well, how do I know I'm wounded? Or how do I know what a wound is? This is a great way. You're driving in your car, you're going throughout your day, and something triggers you, you know, something just makes you lose your mind, you know, whatever. Ta-da, that's, that's a wound, something's there. So as soon as you have the opportunity, you go into a quiet place and you get in prayer with the Lord and you ask, you ask the Lord, Father, show me like why, and you can speak to Father, Son, Holy Spirit, whatever you're comfortable with. So, you know, I go through all three. Um, why did that trigger me? 
uh, Holy Spirit, please um, just like, please show me a memory or a person or something. Show me the root of what, you know, where this trigger is coming from. And he is faithful. He will, something will pop into your mind. And if you're an overly analytical person, don't overanalyze, you know, whatever pops into your mind, trust, trust that that's given to you by the Holy Spirit. So a lot of times it'll be a memory. Um, and if it helps, you can be writing this down. So then, so then you just keep, keep in conversation with the Lord, you know, okay, so this memory, what is it about this memory? Um, and then just let the memory play if it's a memory. Like, for example, I got triggered by something and I went and I did this for myself and a memory came up um, when I was like five years old. Um, I was in a dance recital and you know how they do pictures, you know, like usually like the week before or whatever. And I could see I was in the room off of the dance studio and the costume was like ridiculous of these giant bows and my mom because we're taking pictures made me put lip liner she put it on me her lip liner and her dark lipstick i was like five years old and i remember one of the girls she was older was like laughing kind of making fun of me and then i remember i went in the mirror and i just looked at myself and i felt like i hate myself so that's the <laughs> i just got emotional that that's the memory that holy spirit brought up um, when I went to, why is this thing happening today that triggered me? And then I'm able to walk through. So the memory comes up, the emotions come up, and then you identify them. Just as I was saying, oh, Jesus, I feel so, I feel self-hatred. I feel embarrassed. I feel angry at my mom. I feel, you know, whatever it is, bring it all up. Let it come up. And then picture yourself, or you can even say, Jesus, I want you to take this from me. Take it from me and see him taking them. And then see, you know, and when we're do, leading somebody through this, you might ask like, what did he do with them? And people say the funniest things, like he rolled them up in a ball and he threw it, you know, or, or he ate it or he burned it or, you know, whatever he does, it doesn't matter, you know, it's just go with it. So he, you see him taking those emotions and then you ask him what he has in return for you. So instead of those uh, negative emotions, um, you, you want him to be healing that. So you, you see him and he comes, you ask Jesus what he has for you instead of the negative emotions. And then you, um, you ask him to pour his love on you and to speak truth over you. And as he's speaking that truth, that's him binding up the broken heart. So in the little example I gave you, it would be, um, you know, okay, Jesus, take this like self-hatred or embarrassment. What do you have for me instead? You are beautiful. You are a child of God. You know, you, um, uh, I love you. You know, you are loved beyond measure, whatever it is. Sometimes it'll be scripture. Sometimes it'll be just something personal to you. Sometimes it could be one word. Maybe he just holds you and hugs you and just, you just feel infused with his love, whatever it is. So this is the process of the healing. And then now this is where you would then extend forgiveness to anyone else that's in the situation. So again, in this example, um, then I would extend forgiveness to my mom. Um, so it says forgiveness isn't cheap, it's mandatory. So you have to let that other person go in order to uh, receive complete healing and freedom. But remember, you take that opportunity to tell that person what they did to you and what it cost you. You know, it's like, I remember when I was younger, I mean, people, it's like you had a problem with somebody and you write them the nastiest letter and then you burn it you know you're not you you get it out of you and then you give it to god basically so now you picture yourself actually giving that person if there's another person in your memory into jesus hands and you say lord please take them i am not responsible for them or what they did and i release them over to you because remember we we are not the judge okay the only righteous judge is God. So we're in sin when we're holding judgment against other people. Even, and, and, and I'm giving a really shallow example. There are people who have been truly and severely traumatized. And so I'm not taking this lightly and it's not a one and done thing. But if you really know, if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you know, you know him as that, he is your healer. If anybody can heal you, it's going to be him. And it's a process. Um, now you ask the Lord, did I believe any lies because of this situation? So after you've presented your thing to Jesus, you've handed it to him, you've forgiven anybody else in that, now you want him to reveal to you what lies, um, that I'm not loved, that I'm not good enough, um, that I'm ugly, that my mom doesn't love me, you know, whatever, it's always nasty, lies are nasty, they're designed to hurt us and keep us in bondage, because who who can 
live the abundant life if you believe those things. So Jesus, show me what, um, you know, what lies were put on me by the enemy. Then you must confess those lies as they come to you. Father, I, I confess that I'm believing that I wasn't lovable, that you didn't even love me. I, I confess that I was um, having self-hatred and, you know, whatever they are. So you confess, then you repent. Father, God, forgive me for believing those lies, lies about myself, lies about you. And then you renounce. Um, so it says this is part of deliverance from the mindset. You're, re you're releasing yourself from the mindsets that have come in because of that lie. Um, and those are things that hold you in bondage. Demons can't read your mind. You have to speak out loud that you're not in agreement with the lie anymore and that you're sorry and you wanna be forgiven and cover the offense in the blood of Jesus Christ. So make sure you're looking for all the lies you believe because of the injury and all self declarations that you may have made because this happened. So you confess and you repent for all that the Lord shows you. And that's, I'm glad I read that because yes, out loud, out loud, a declaration to the demons, you're breaking your covenant with them. You're breaking that legal right. You're declaring that it's no more. Finally, you renounce all agreement with the demons that have tormented the wound, such as I renounce agreement with spirit of self-hate, a spirit of rejection, a spirit of envy, a spirit of anger. Again, whatever that the Lord showed you, whatever lies came under or self-declarations you made, you renounce agreement with those spirits and you command them to leave. I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. And it says uh, they will leave and you will be set free because anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. 20, uh, 232, Joel 232. Finally, you ask the Holy Spirit to fill every place in your soul that's been healed and set free. Give God a chance to fill you up again and speak truth over you. Wherever you give, give God something, he will always give something in return to fill it up because we don't wanna leave those spaces empty because then they get filled back up with our own junk again. So he'll fill you up with words, visions, truth, peace to bring life to areas in your soul that have been wounded and bound. This is the process of being set free. You know, whoever is free is free indeed. The truth shall set you free, Jesus. Holy Spirit, Father, they will set you free. It's a lifelong process. And don't get caught up in, oh, did I do it right or do it wrong? Just go with the Holy Spirit and he will guide you. He will guide you. Candace, thank you so much for walking people through how to be delivered from wounds that maybe wounds that they didn't even know they had. I feel like that's really deep. And everyone, if you're watching and you're blessed by what Candace Summer has been saying, please like and subscribe. Now, Candace, right now, could you tell everybody where you can be reached if you have an email, website, um, YouTube, uh, whatever? Yes. Um, I You can email me at Candace Sumera, which you'll see my name there at gmail.com. And I do have a YouTube channel. Um, again, you can just type in Candace Sumera, The Walk, um, but I think the title is Candace Sumera. And I have a YouTube channel there. I, I haven't posted a video in like four or five months. So I'm going to say it's a, but, uh, <laughs> but it, you know, see, it's funny because the Holy Spirit, I had something personal going on in my life and the Holy Spirit said, just be quiet, you know, just, you need to process like what's going on. And um, I kept kind of checking in, like, do I want to make a video? And I just didn't really want to make a video. And then it's funny, uh, a very lovely lady reached out to me, was starting her own channel and wanted me to share my testimony. And I feel like I could never say no if somebody wants me to share my testimony because it's not my testimony. It's the it's the Lord's testimony. And so that kind of brought me out of hibernation. Um, and we, we kind of touched on this a little bit. And actually, that's when I heard the Holy Spirit say contact Jennifer. So this is only the second thing I've done um, in like four or five months. But thank you. You are such a wonderful, gracious spirit. And it was so kind of you to allow me back on here and you ask amazing questions. And I, I really so appreciate you. And I'm just praying that this, this is received in, in, in a really positive way, because this is powerful stuff. Amen. And I'm really glad you did contact because when you were discussing what you were discussing with me or conversing with me, I said, okay, these are topics that definitely need to be addressed. So I really appreciate it. And just to let you know, I did not know your last name was pronounced Samara. So for the past year or so, I've been calling you Candace Samara. 
Um, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, all right, Candace, uh, could you pray for our audience right now? I know you prayed at the beginning, but could you close us out in prayer for everyone who are saying, okay, everything Candace said made so much sense. I realize I do have wounds right now. Maybe I was involved in yoga. Uh, maybe, you know, I have church hurt hurt. Um, there are a lot of things that I've realized in myself that I needed deliverance from and Candace helped me see this. Um, so could you pray for those right now who actually saw that, okay, they have something and they need it to be delivered from them? Yes, I would be happy to do that. Thank you. All right. Heavenly father, we just first want to thank you and praise you for this time, um, for this platform, for this opportunity, for this divine appointment. And we just ask that you would touch every person's heart um, who is resonating and responding to this lord that you would come to them in a mighty way show your grace your mercy your glory your peace Lord. we just ask that you would fall upon them that they would that they would find the courage within themselves to um if it takes courage for them even just to ask holy spirit show me maybe maybe they don't believe maybe they think they're not going to be able to see or hear but you know it is the right of every believer it says in your word to hear to hear the word of God, um, to, to hear the Lord's voice. So um, I just want to just break any hindrance in the spirit to anybody who thinks that they cannot hear. It is your right as a believer to hear from the Lord. And so I'm just speaking that over everyone right now. And we just thank you, Father. We thank you that you are a good, good Father. You are so faithful that you want us to live life and live it to the abundant fullness that Jesus paid for, Lord. And we just pray, give us wisdom give us discernment give us um knowledge in you lord give us a, a heart that is on fire for your word that we just want to drink it up that it be as living water to our souls lord and we just we thank you we thank you for the gift of life and the gift that um your son gave us in coming and um, I, I just ask that you be strong with every person that hears this lord that you just cover them with grace, peace, your love and mercy. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray this. Amen. Amen. Candace Samira, thank you so much <laughs> for sharing your testimony and joining us again and for sharing with us everything the Lord put on your heart to share. Thank you. If you'd like to be born again and give your life to Jesus Christ today, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and am lost without you. I'm convinced that you're my only saving grace and my only hope. No longer do I want to do life without you. I believe that you came to earth to die on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead three days later, and are coming back for me one day soon. Please come into my heart and be my Lord, Savior, and friend. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer, get yourself a Bible and read it daily and ask God to interpret every word for you. Then surround yourself with like-minded believers in Jesus Christ. Congratulations and welcome to the family.